Welcome to Mayo Clinic Q&A. We're recording this segment on Wednesday, April the 29th, 2020. On this show, we like to uh, engage in various formats uh, for our questions and answers. And today, we would like to ask Dr. Greg Poland, an infectious disease expert from Mayo Clinic, whom you are all getting to know very well, to help us answer some listener questions uh, that have been um, provided to us. Yeah. Good Welcome, morning, Dr. Greg. Poland. Yeah, good morning. Well, Greg, the burning question after the nightly news last night is that there is a dog named Winston who's a pug, and he uh, contracted COVID-19 from his owner, who's a veterinarian. A couple of the family members were infected. How can people help to keep their pets safe? Is this a, is this a concern and can the pets give the virus to us? You know, certainly uh, dogs and cats do have their own set of coronaviruses that they don't really spread to humans. So we are learning as we go along here, but traditionally the feeling has been that these novel coronaviruses are, are really not an issue in terms of passing back and forth between humans and their pets. However, having said that, there's one dog, there's a few tigers, and there's a handful of cats that have now been diagnosed, that is have positive RT-PCR assays against uh, COVID-19. So it does occur, it apparently is pretty rare, but nonetheless, out of caution, I think the CDC has made the appropriate recommendation, which is if you uh, have somebody in your family or in your home that's infected, then stay away from your pet. Similarly, then this is kind of funny in a way, but social distancing with pets when you do take them out for a walk, keep them away from other dogs and cats. Um, and, and I think that's just good advice. I've read that ultraviolet light kills viruses. Does that include sunlight? And is it uh, on my skin and on my body or does sunlight just kill the virus uh, on surfaces? Uh, that's a great question. It's a, it's a common one because people are anxious to take appropriate precautions. We do know that in higher temperature, higher humidity, high amounts of UV sunlight, that the virus persists for shorter periods of time than in the absence of those conditions. Now the caution, taking artificial UV light and applying it to your skin is frankly dangerous. Uh, there's a few settings in which we do it very carefully in people who have certain skin conditions, but this is not a good option for everyday use in terms of skin. UV light, disinfectants, bleaches, anything like that are very effective but confined to the disinfection or sanitization of hard surfaces, not human bodies and not skin. Our next question um, is around herd immunity. First mm -hmm. of all, what is herd immunity? How will it be developed against this virus? And won't we all have to be out in the public again for that to be to take place or to be effective? Well, herd immunity basically means if you could envision a circle, let's say of 100 people inside this circle, and if you could imagine the susceptible people being in the center of that, the more immune people around the susceptible people, the less likely the virus can penetrate in and actually infect somebody. So that's the idea behind herd immunity. Next question is how much herd immunity? Well, we know with influenza that that number's somewhere in the 60%. With measles, it's about 95%. Coronavirus is probably gonna fall into that neighborhood of 70-ish percent or so, something like that. So how do you acquire herd immunity? Well, there are really only two ways. You became immune because you got infected. And in the context of COVID-19, that means you have to be willing to accept a lot of severe illnesses and even deaths to get there, or you have a strategy like a vaccine where you can, in a sense, artificially make somebody immune by tricking the body into thinking that it has seen the virus made antibody and that antibody be protective. So we have two options. Um, one is, uh, and you've seen some countries do this, say no restrictions, we're gonna go for herd immunity. You look in Scandinavian countries, for example, some of them have done that. They've had very high de death rates. 
Other countries have not done that. They have very low death rates. The consequence of saying, we're not gonna go for that, we're gonna do social distancing, is that we have to wait for the vaccine. That means we have lower number of cases, but we push them out longer. So we don't overwhelm the medical system. At some point we have therapies or a vaccine and overall reduce the burden of infection. You mentioned flu, mm -hmm. um, another virus that's common in the winter time. How is this so different from the flu and why are the concerns and the approaches to management feeling so different to all of us? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because you know, this coming fall, unlike this year when we really didn't have COVID until February, March timeframe, this coming fall, the, the COVID season and the flu season are likely to overlap exactly, and they cause the same initial symptoms. So there'll be a lot of fear and concern, which is why we push getting the flu vaccine. The comparison is often made between the two, and, and it's a fair comparison, with one exception. We have to look at the difference in severity and the difference in death rate. So one study actually just got released and they were looking particularly in New York City, so, so sort of geographic boundaries. And they were looking at excess deaths due to seasonal influenza and excess deaths due to COVID-19. And it's kind of a stunning number, almost a 21-fold higher excess death rate due to COVID-19 than seasonal influenza. So, you know, the measures that we're taking, while some people feel they're extreme, when you look at a 21-fold difference between the death rates of influenza and the death rates of COVID-19, that's a really important difference in human health. And it's a, it, a, to me, it justifies the measures that we're taking as a nation. Our next uh, listener question is about antibodies. We've done some talking about antibodies and even the plasma and testing. When will we know whether the development of antibodies is uh, protective against um, COVID developing in the future in the same um, individual? Yeah, this is a really tough question because by ELISA serology, we can detect antibodies. And most people would feel that at least for a short period of time, that's likely to indicate a protected state, but we don't know that for sure. And the, the, the two big questions is, are that we don't know how high an antibody level you need to be protected, and we don't know how long that antibody will last, last in your bloodstream to know that you're protected. So, so we're in this scenario where we can test for the antibody, we don't know how much antibody you need to be protected, and we don't know for how long that antibody will persist and protect you. So a lot to learn that. Studies, including in my own lab, are ongoing to, to help determine that, but we, we just don't know yet. So is it essentially true that even if um, an individual has been infected with COVID-19 that we have to assume that they could become reinfected? We have to assume that they will be, they could become reinfected at some point in the future. And, and we just don't know. So, you know, for example, the seasonal coronaviruses, antibody against those and against reinfection lasts months to maybe a couple years. With SARS back in 2003, that antibody could be detected and seemed to protect for about two to three years, and then you couldn't detect antibody. MERS was even shorter. So what will it be with this virus? You know, we've got, what, 16 weeks experience, so we don't really know about the long term yet. You know, I'm working at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and even seeing patients in the clinic, but things look a lot different than they did before. We're all wearing masks, we're distancing, there are fewer people uh, here working in the offices. And our next uh, listener had a question about what will things be like after the pandemic? Can we predict what will be different in our workplaces and in our schools in the future, wow. having gone through this experience and knowing yeah. that this virus exists? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And it really has accelerated um, the use of technology to do our work. I suspect in the post-COVID world, when and if we get there, 
I suspect we won't travel as much for business because we can do what we're doing right now. I suspect there'll be more distance learning in school. We have a generation now that went through half a school year and learned how to do that. Uh, I suspect we'll do, you and I will do more telehealth, uh, which I think is actually to the patient uh, advantage and certainly much more uh, efficient. At the same time that you and I both know that the ability to sit across from our patient and, and lay hands on and examine a patient is a rich data set that, that we lose when we're, when we're distant from one another. But I really think the key thing that's gonna change is our awareness of just how much disruption, morbidity, and mortality respiratory diseases in general cause. And I think we're gonna be much more careful about that. I think we will become, and in some ways I hope we do become, much more of a mask wearing society during the time that we have respiratory pathogens circulating. As you know, I've been a fan of that uh, well over 10 years ago in saying that uh, I think all healthcare workers should be required to be immunized against diseases that they could potentially transmit to a patient. Just because I think, you know, uh, the pledge you and I took was first do no harm. And, and I think that's the very first step in it is I don't walk into a patient room without washing my hands. I don't examine a patient without washing my hands. When I'm done, I wash my hands. If I'm sick, I don't go to work. Um, if it's uh, influenza season, of course I get my flu shot. If I have any symptoms at all, I'd wear a mask. And I think we're gonna start to see that happen, particularly in the healthcare workplace, and that'll be a signal to other uh, workplace environments to do the same. Well, you've been listening to Mayo Clinic Q&A today. Um, I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. I've been here with Dr. Greg Poland answering some listener questions for today. We thank you for listening in with us and thank you so much, Dr. Poland, for as always taking time for us today. Oh, my pleasure, it's a great honor. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.